Please open your books to page 64. Last week we began our discussion of the four step and how to teach the four step. Uh, we also took a look at four step and what it is and what it is not. And uh, we got a part of the way into the resentment of this. I'd like to uh, get us all back on all fours here on, on this four step before we continue. First of all, it's important to understand the four step is not, is not an autobiography. It doesn't consist of 697 questions. The four step is as written in the big book and the, 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 uh, uh, directions that we have to follow is not a broad sword, it is a rapier. It goes directly to those things which are an issue at the time, the things that we must, that we must uh, find out about ourselves. We find that the, <clears throat> the stage is set for us when we have completed our third step. At the top of page 64, the big book talks about this and talks about the third step saying that though our decision, and it's talking about the decision now, the third step, decision to turn our life and our will over the care of God, though our decision was a vital and crucial step, could have little permanent effect unless at once, followed by a strenuous effort to find and to be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking. And what part of that once don't we understand? This does not mean sometime down the road when your lazy sponsor gets around to it. This means now. It also tells us exactly where we stand with the third step. Please don't fall into the trap of believing that somehow or another the third step is a step of surrender. It's not. It is a step to where we decide to surrender. It is that step where we go to God offering ourselves to God. In effect, we're saying, God, here I am, take me. But we have much work to do. We have to find out what's wrong with us. We have to not only find out what's wrong with us and write it down, but we have to admit it. We have to articulate it. We have to admit to another human being, along with God and ourselves. We have to do our best step. Then we take it to God. But that's not the end either, because as we do our four step, we also find out those that we have harmed, and the harm which we've done them. And in our four step, we become willing to make amends to them. In effect, our eighth step is done, substantially finished by the time we do our fourth step. And we must be free of the guilt and the remorse and the shame that are the product of the harm that we've done others. Otherwise, we remain blocked from God. What does it say? We have to find and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Now, if we go back to the third step, we'll see why. In the third step, we ask God to take away our difficulties, but we don't know what they are. We haven't done anything to find out. We know that something is dreadfully wrong with us, but we don't know what it is. Take away my difficulties, we ask God, so that the victory you give me over them will bear witness to those that would help of thy love, thy power, and thy way of life. And now we set about doing the task which we committed ourselves to do in the third step, which is to, is to work the rest of the steps, especially to get started on that fourth step and find out what's wrong with us. What are my difficulties? What are my insanities, my defects, and my guilt? I don't know. I've got some vague ideas. I might even have a couple of specific notions in mind. But if I'm going to thoroughly understand exactly what it is about me that needs to be changed, I'm going to have to do my fourth and my fifth step. We also found out that we were, we, we were looking square in the face of another leap of faith. 
Now we've already we've already taken a couple of those, and these were 20 league the 20 league leaps of faith. This was another small matter coming from a place of rebellion and defiance and uh, and denial. We've already arrived at a place where we have come to believe that in fact God has the power that God exists and He has the power to restore us to sanity. And not only have we come to decide that and to believe that, but we've also decided that it's time to quit playing God, that we're going to have to make a move here, a major move in life, where we quit depending upon ourselves and uh, get out of self and seek to turn our life and our will over the care of God. Major, major step. And we take that leap of faith because we are led to a place of making that decision. And we've had a great gift given to us. That decision has come to us. Nobody can make us do it. We're sponsors. We can't make somebody make that decision. But we can guide them in their prayers, in their meditations, in their meetings, in their reading of the big book, and their understanding of the program, most especially in being an example to them so that they will want what we have and that uh, third step decision will come but now it's time to get busy and get, do something about all that <coughs> and so we now see another major leap of faith staring us in the face but why what is it about this that, that, that drives us forward well on page 64 the big book tells us First of all, we've already learned back in the fourth chapter that our dilemma is lack of power, that we're going to have to find a power greater than ourselves by which we can live, and that that's what this book's all about, that its main purpose is to enable you and me and the people we sponsor to find a power greater than themselves which will solve their problem. And then it says this means we're going to talk about God. You know weasel words, no pussy putting around in the big book, you know, that, that's all stuff that comes out of these meetings. I don't know where we get it. I really don't. Big Book makes no bones whatsoever about it. We're talking about God. Every time you see higher power and you see it's capitalized, you know that means a deity. It doesn't mean somebody's pickup truck or a doorknob or ashtray or, or even an AA group. Think about it. You ever see anybody get down their knees and pray to their group? I doubt it. I never have. I've been around a long time. And so, now then, this tells us at the bottom of page 64 that our real problem is a spiritual disease. Let's translate that to spiritual bankruptcy. Or, if you wish, spiritual weakness. And that from this spiritual weakness, we find that we have been not only mentally and spiritually, physically ill, but we've been spiritually sick. And now, here comes the rule. And this is something that you and I need to know and to count upon. We need to believe that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we and our sponsees will straighten out mentally and physically. And as you go along, if you're relatively new, as you go along, you're going to see many examples of the miracles that transpire in the lives of the people you work with, the people you know, who have been on a spiritual path and their mental and physical conditions have miraculously improved. And in some cases, physical infirmities or mental infirmities which were life-threatening or, uh, or crippling, will be gone. And the, uh, the medical profession, the psychiatric profession, they, they're looking at something they don't understand, they can't see, they don't, beyond their, beyond their ability, beyond their, their can. But we know, because we have to find out in here, and we do find out if we stick around for a while, there's nothing past God's power. The only thing that, that, that that uh, curtails God's power is us. And that's through our doubt and our lack of faith and our willingness to 
express that doubt and, and then laugh with each other about, oh, well, God has a sense of humor and he doesn't, he's going to take away all my defects and he's, he's going to do this and he's not going to do that. How the hell do we know? And we lay those kinds of trips on ourselves, but then if we do it to other people, shame on us. Because we only limit God's power through our lack of faith. So this is the way we must always approach it. Even if you want to mess around with your own life, don't do it with the life of somebody else. <laughs> then we talked about getting into this, uh, into our resentment list. And remember that there are there are four parts to the fist, to the four step: the resentments, the list of our own faults and the people we've harmed, our fears, and our sex inventory, which also includes a list of people we've harmed. Those four are four separate, distinct, discrete parts. They do not meld together in this sense. The big book does not indulge itself ever in comparative fault. And when you see these forms that are scattered all over the fellowship where you have to write down what they did to you and then you write down what they you did to them and then Supposedly, you come out in the middle somewhere. It's like vanilla ice cream with no chocolate sauce on there, and almost nothing there, unless you have to like vanilla. It doesn't. It doesn't. It ends up not meaning anything because the people who want us only, always to feel good are afraid that if we really look at what somebody else has done to us, we're going to feel bad, or if we look at to see what we did to them without reference to what they did to us, we're going to feel bad. Well, so what? Hoo-ha. That, it's the stuff that's been, that's what's been killing us. That's what we have to find out. And so we don't compare the harm of one with the harm of another. Big Book doesn't do that. Steps don't do that. They're separate and apart. So the first part of our fourth step is going to be a very thoroughgoing analysis <coughs> in writing of the harm that others have done us. Not I repeat this now, it's real important to understand, this is not to indict them. We're not out to make anybody bad or wrong. We're only trying to find out what happened. And we're trying to find out what they did so that we can be set free from the results of that. In other words, as Bill said, when they asked him, how do I know if I did a proper course step, he said, if you have any resentments left, when you get through it, you didn't do it right. Which means very simply that you did not apply the spiritual remedy to, which will free you from your resentments, the ones you brought in here. That doesn't mean that more resentments will crop up, sure, because resentments always flow from fear, and the world will continue to threaten us, and there will be anger, and there will be resentment. But now, when that starts to happen, we know what to do with it. we got all the tools we need to be free of those resentments before they grab us by the throat. And so in the second part of the fourth step, we're going to be looking at our own faults without reference to what people did to us. It doesn't matter. Any more than it would matter when we set out to make amends. Remember how clear and cut that rule is. We deal only with the things that we've done. We do not blame them. We do not catechize their sins. Only talk about our own. And so when we get ready to write our course step then, we need to find out what it is and who it is that we resent. We don't want to leave anybody or anything out. Resentments are like termites, you don't see them. They're, once in a while you might see one flying around, a little bit of deja vu there. But these things are eating away at the foundations of our lives. And that's why we have to be real careful to dig down and find out exactly what these resentments are. We don't want to miss any of them. We don't want to leave any of that cancer in our soul. So we, I, this is not in the book, and this is from my own experience, but I can promise you that it works. We just make a list of all the people who have ever been important in our lives, the ones who have been significant or important to us, getting right back in the beginning of our lives with our families and bringing it forward. And then we ask ourselves some questions about these people to find out if there is any, if, if any of them are those who get about 
whom we ought to be writing. We ask ourselves if at any time in the past they angered us or threatened us or wronged us or harmed us or were they unfair to us at some time? And if we answer yes to any of these questions, then we know that we're going to need to write about them. We're going to write down what they did. And then we go to page 65 and we find our resentment list is laid out in the form of a little example here. And we're going to do our resentment list exactly the way this example teaches us. Three columns. The first column is the name of the person. The middle column is what they did. What did she do to harm me? What did she do to threaten me? What did she do to me that was wrong? Where in the world was she unfair to me? And we write that down. Just what they did. And then finally, in the third column, we're going to be looking at those things about ourselves which were hurt, interfered with, or threatened by the actions of these folks. And if you look at that little list, it's just above the resentment example. We find self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal relations, and sex relations. Now when we examine those closely, what do we find? We find that we are looking squarely in the face of the three God-given natural instincts for sex, security, and society. And when we look at it from that standpoint, we realize that where fear has been involved, fear has attacked our natural God-given instincts, that is where our defects of character arose. And here we're looking at security, of course, is one of the natural instincts. Our personal relations relates to our instinct for society and our sex relations, that's obvious what that relates to. And what we have found is that when our natural God-given instincts are warped and perverted and twisted out of shape by fear, that we're, we're goofy, we're screwy, we're nuts. Our minds don't work right. That's why we need to look at this in the second step, that God is strong enough, powerful enough to restore us to sanity. In other words, we're going to be, if we follow through and do the, follow the directions, we will be back in a place where our natural instincts are as God intended them to be, so our minds start functioning properly and sanely and rationally. But at this stage, if we look at our resentments, we can see just how badly skewed our natural re our natural instincts have been. And we will see as we write this the, this third column that in every instance where we have resentment, there was also fear. And this makes it pretty simple. We stop and think about it. You wouldn't be angry with me unless I threatened you in some way. And we're going to find that behind every anger, behind every resentment, there's fear. So we write out our resentment list exactly as it's laid out here. And then we're ready to go back and take a look at it. I'm down at the bottom of page 65, and let's see where we go from here. There is a remedy for these resentments. It is a spiritual remedy. Let's see how the big book leads us up to it. Three lines up from the bottom of the page. We went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that the that this world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continue to wrong us and we stay sore. You notice the word wrong is repeated three times in three consecutive sentences. This is almost unheard of in the big book. Bill very seldom ever did that. He always used synonyms where he could. But here the word that was critical to understand was that we have had wrongs committed by other people which have caused us to be angry and resentful. And it's necessary for us to be willing to look at that and admit it. Now, that could be a problem because, especially if we've been harmed by somebody upon whom we depended, like perhaps our parents. 
there's a great human tendency to deny the wrong, to blame ourselves, to swallow it, to uh, forget it, to rationalize it. <coughs> Our self-delusion oftentimes is overwhelming in the sense that though these wrongs have been committed, we still continue to deny them. How many times have you seen people who were seriously dependent upon others and those others had harmed them significantly and yet they will continue to say, but I love him, that kind of stuff. And they absolutely are not willing to do anything which might possibly break that dependency. And so it is with uh, many of our resentments, they are, uh, they're there okay, but we would like to say that they're not. We don't want to be the one who blames, for example, our parents. But we like to say things like, she did the best she could. Well, in, in most cases, that's very doubtful. In most cases, she didn't do the best she could. And what difference does it make whether she did or not? The resentment's still there. Because we're not talking about whether she's to be blamed, whether we're going to indict her, we're not going to the, to the state's attorney about this. We're just trying to find out what happened to us. We need to know what our present reality is so we can deal with it. And we can only deal with it with God's help. And so going on, Sometimes it was remorse, and then we restored ourselves, but, but the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. Now, my gosh, we've already learned that lesson, haven't we, back in that third step. There are problems of our own making, that they arise out of ourselves, that the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. And we've been trying to run our lives and suit ourselves. We've been playing God. It didn't work. There is a God. It's not me. And here we see the same thing. We fought and tried to have our own way. Matters got worse. And then, how about this business of taking revenge or getting retribution or getting back at them? As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Much of what we did all the way up to the time we walked through that door was short-lived. We'd get a new car in a week, it would have already worn out. In two weeks, we were resigning the payments we had to make. In three weeks, it was about that time we woke up and realized how much the insurance was going to cost. So what in the world am I doing? Besides which, this is only a Beamer, and my neighbor next door has a Mercedes. <laughs> Not to speak of how we feel when we get that boat we always wanted. <laughs> Two best days in the boat of our life, the day they buy it and the day they sell it. <laughs> and we get all these wonderful things, and they turn to ashes in our mouth, you know, we, and every time we get revenge, we think, oh, revenge is sweet. <laughs> the Hatfields and McCoys. And, and it's just, just like in good old Sicily. Oh, it reminds me, you know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? Why? They hate all Witnesses. They hate all Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now let's see let's see what more is revealed to us here on page 80 on 66. It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these to to squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. Gosh, can't you just feel it? I mean, it, it, thinking back and realizing just exactly what was going on with us before we walked in that door. Eaten alive by anger and resentment, hatred, 
thoughts of revenge? What happened to those days? What happened to those hours? We were just flushing down the toilet, weren't we? We look up and the day was gone and there was no happiness at all. We squandered the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely great. Please read the spiritual experience for spiritual awakening. Now, Bill wrote spiritual experience, and he always used that term. Spiritual awakening was not added until the editors got hold of the 12th step and changed it. But what he's talking about here is spiritual experience, meaning the totality of our spiritual, our spiritual experiences, the totality of the miracles that are worked in our lives. And if, if, if we're looking for maintenance and growth of the spiritual experience, the business of resentment is infinitely great. We found that it is fatal. Now, when you, when you look at that, and when your sponsee looks at it, you may well get questions about this. What does this mean? What does it mean that the resentments are infinitely grave and that they're fatal? Well, the next sentence, for when harboring these feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit, and the insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again with us is to drink, to drink is to die. Now, let's understand here that we're, this is taking us right back to basics. The basics, what are the basics? We are alcoholics. Alcoholism is a deadly, incurable, progressive illness. An alcoholic cannot, by definition, cannot stop drinking on his own or her own, by definition. We are powerless. If we don't stop drinking, we die. If we are to stop drinking, we must get the power of a higher power between us and the booze. If we're blocked off from God, that doesn't happen. Resentments block us from God. Ergo, ipso facto, if I'm filled with resentment, I will drink and die. Because I have no chance of being in a place where God stands between me and the booze. I've got to get in his pocket and I've got to stay there. For us to drink is to die. And Therefore, anything which blocks me from the sunlight of the Spirit blocks me from recovery. It's simple, isn't it? And these are, one of the things that we try to do in this workshop is to see just how bloody simple this program really is. And every time we're tempted to, to, to complicate it, to make more out of it than is there, all we do is make it more difficult for ourselves and for our sponsees to understand and to, and to do the work. The second full paragraph on page 66. This little paragraph is a terrible thorn in the side of those who practice psychobabble and who practice the human solutions. Because it tells us something directly opposite to what they like to believe. It says if we were to live, which of course means as opposed to die, we had to be free of anger. The growth, the, the grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. Now grouch is pretty self-explanatory. Brainstorm does not mean bright idea. It means a storm of the brain, a rage. We're not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of a normal man, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. 
Now then, it means quite simply this, if someone should approach you with the uh, human solution concept that, oh, well, there is appropriate anger, you know. We all get angry once in a while. What you ask them is, oh, yes? Then there is also such a thing as appropriate strychnine, I guess. It isn't anything to do with appropriateness, is it? Not a thing in the world. This is an extreme danger for us. Now, why? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You never anger with me unless I threaten you. My anger is always a product of my fears. Fear is my enemy. When we look at it, we have to realize that our defects of character, the Godfather of all of our defects, is our pride. But fear is the hitman that pride sends forth to kill us. Fear is a killer. Fear is our enemy. And fear is the progenitor of our angers. <coughs> if we're to live, we have to be free of anger. Now think about that for a second, and it becomes obvious that to stay free of anger, I must learn how to stay free of fear, right? And therefore, it's necessary for me to learn the solution to fear. Well, thank you, God, you provided that for us in our fourth and fifth step. And we're going to take a look at that, if not today, then uh, next week. So then finally, the last partial paragraph on page 66. Now this is going to state the problem. And here again, knowing the big book, we realize that the big book never states the problem without immediately thereafter giving us the answer. We turn back to the list, which is our resentment list now, for it held the key to the future. That's pretty strong language. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. We were being dominated by our resentments, angers, rages, and fears arising out of the actions of others toward us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had the power to actually kill. Again, the same syllogism. We are powerless over alcohol. We are alcoholics. We are <coughs> sick with a disease which will kill us, which is incurable and progressive. Our only hope is to place God between us and the booze. And our resentments block us from the sunlight of the spirit. Therefore, our resentments have the power to actually kill. How could we escape? Okay, here's the, here's the problem now. We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. Oh, wow, listen to that. We are as powerless over our resentments as we are over alcohol. That powerlessness business extends beyond alcohol, doesn't it? We already found out we were powerless over our selfishness and self-centeredness. Now we find we're powerless over our resentments as well. And in the case of our selfishness, we found out that the answer was God. That we couldn't get rid of them ourselves, but the guy could. So, that's the problem. Now, what's the solution? Next little paragraph starts two lines up from the bottom of page 66. This was our course. That means this is the solution. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Now, i got to tell you honestly, when I read that, I said, oh, oh, come on. That's just a major league excuse. What you're telling me is that I'm not supposed to be angry at these people because they're sick. They're sick like me. I just got through learning about all this disease I've got, and now I'm totally unique. It's only we alcoholics that have this disease. 
what are you trying to tell me here that there's just two? Ah, but you see, the answer is in the big book, like the answer to everything else. But you just have to know where to find it. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing here, see. We, we're kind of sneaky now. We get to we get to elucidate this matter with our sponsees by having them turn to page 116, all the way up in chapter to lives. And then the other page is going to show us how and what way the people who have harmed us are sick too. Page 116, 116. <coughs> Second full paragraph, 116. We've also remarked, this is the wise now, one wife talking to another, it's really Bill Wilson and Drag, but we'll forgive that. We have also remarked how much better life is when lived on a spiritual plane. If God can solve the angel rhythm of outlook, he can solve your problems too. Here it comes. We wise found that, like everybody else, that means everybody, the whole world, all human beings, like everybody else. We were afflicted with pride, self-pity, vanity, and all the things which go to make up the self-centered person. And we were not above selfishness or dishonesty. Now what did we just find out about ourselves? That our problems are our own making, they arise out of ourselves. We found that selfishness and self-pity and vanity and ego and all those things were the hallmark of our disease. These are the symptomatic, these are symptomatic of the disease of outlism as it centers in the mind. Not as it centers in the body, but as it centers in the mind. And here we find that everybody else is also selfish and dishonest. Now of course there are, I suppose, a few Mother Teresa's out there, but not a whole bunch of them. For the most part, the people who have harmed us have harmed us out of their own sense of hopelessness, helplessness, out of the reaction to their own self-pity, their pride, their dishonesty, their selfishness. The exact same thing to the one with us. The only difference being that we have an affliction of the body they do not have. Because we cannot tolerate alcohol. And when we take the alcohol into our system, then any amount at all it sets off a phenomenal craving. So now we know when we go back to page 67, the big one tell us the truth. That they, like ourselves, were sick too. Page 67, top of the page. We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience. We would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And when a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? You notice the first part of our prayer then is how can I be helpful? It's only that we get a little further down. God save me from being angry. First we ask, how can I be helpful? And I will be done. Now then, one of our dear friends wrote an article for this book, which was published in the third edition and is carried forward. Thank you, God. And thank you, all those wonderful, bright people out there. And I knew that you didn't get rid of this story. Freedom from Bondage, the back of the book. Take, take a look, please, at page 552. Our dear friend here has given us the, the direct and, may I say, perfect key, which never fails if we but use it. 552. 552. And here it is. And those of you, and there are many of you here who use this all the time, so you know what, I'm, you know what the book is saying. And you know what I'm talking about when I say it works. If you have a resentment you want to be free of, if you will pray for the person or the thing you resent, you will be free. 
If you will ask in prayer for everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you will be free. Ask for their health, their prosperity, their happiness, and you will be free. Even when you don't want it for them, and your prayers are only words, and you don't mean it, go ahead and do it anyway. Do it every day for two weeks and you will find you have come to mean it and to want it for them, and you will realize that where you used to feel bitterness and resentment and hatred, you now feel compassion and understanding and love. And there is a huge, huge principle involved here. I believe it to be just I believe it to be described best by saying that I cannot hate you and pray for you at the same time. And if I continue to pray long enough, the hatred will be gone. Thought follows action. And this works so beautifully because you're going to have sponsors who are going to say, I can't pray for him. Look what he did to me. You want me to pray for him? Yes, I do. Well, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. You just keep on doing it until it's two weeks ought to be enough. You'll find that this is exactly right, exactly what it's telling you. At the same time that you're praying for them and you're asking God to give them everything you want for yourself, look what's happening. You're in a process of forgiving the wrongs that have been done. And why is that important? Well, it's only critical. It's only life-saving. Now then, if we need to forgive the wrongs that were done us, this tells us exactly why we cannot afford to blur the edges or to obfuscate those wrongs. That's why we don't indulge, indulge ourselves in, in comparative wrongs. That's why these forms that are out there are wrong themselves. They miss the whole damn point. <coughs> we do a four-step resentment list so we find out what it was that was done to us which harmed us and which threatened us and which caused us to be angry and resentful. And part of the remedy, the, the remedy which we need in order to be set free from those resentments is to forgive the wrongs that were done. How in the world are you going to forgive a wrong if you don't know what it is? And the way we're going to find out what that wrong is is to leave it alone, just let it lie the way, exactly the way it is. Those wrongs always arise out of the actions of others. We're going to forgive what they did. We we'll leave it to God to forgive them. But we will forgive what they have done us. And here's a beautiful thing. This is come this comes to me out of experience and the experience of others, and, and I know that it's true. We have a difficult, if not impossible, time forgiving <coughs> the person. It turns out that that's really God's business, not ours. But what we can do is we can forgive the wrongs that were done us. Now, we'll also find that it is virtually impossible to conjure up forgiveness on our own. We may talk about it, we may even express it, we may tell our sponsor or best oh, I've forgiven that. There's great doubt about that. But here's what really works. We go in prayer to God and we say, God, Please make me willing to forgive. Please make me willing to forgive. And what a beautiful thing happens is that we find out that the answer to that prayer is that our, that our forgiveness comes. <clears throat> you know, it's exactly the same thing we did back there in the second step, where we needed to be willing to believe. And even though we didn't want to do it, our sponsor said, Pray anyway. Pray to whom it may concern, or God will be there, but pray anyway. Ask God to make you willing to believe. And when we did that, the willingness came. But with the willingness came belief. Amazing, huh? There's just that little dinky step between willingness and belief. And we're not even aware that we passed through it. It just happens. That's why the big book tells us that the only thing is necessary for us is to be willing to believe. 
And it's from there that all the rest of it comes. And so here, in order to be set free from our resentments, we're going to pray for the people we resent. We're going to ask God to give them everything we want for ourselves. We're going to keep praying for them until we realize that we have had our resentments and hatreds displaced by love. And we're going to ask God for the willingness to forgive the wrongs that were done. And this fulfills what Bill said. And I, I remember we talked about this in the first hour. If you want to know how, whether you did a proper four step or not, if you had any resentments left when you finished it, you didn't do it. Because we have a complete and full solution to resentments right here in our four step. And there's a sponsor that's your responsibility to teach this and to help your sponsees to find this solution for themselves. Most importantly, your responsibility to see to it that they do the work, that they make, that they actually use the prayers. Because if they do, the results are automatic. As a matter of fact, on page 85 in our book, you don't even turn to it, I'll just tell you what's there. They use the word automatic with reference to being restored to sanity. That sanity has returned and that this has happened automatically. In other words, the, the inevitable result of working the steps and following the directions is that things happen automatically. For example, the promises. The promises are the inevitable result of working the steps. We're going to get the promises whether we want them or not. We do the work. We don't think our way through the steps. We don't philosophize our way through the steps. We don't invent anything to get through the steps. We pick up the book, find the directions, and follow the directions. And hopefully we've got a sponsor who knows what he or she's doing. And hopefully when we're working with people, we know what we're doing. Because it is, it is these directions which must be followed. That's where all the power is. Stop and think about it for a second. Before this, this big book came along, there wasn't a word in writing anywhere which encompassed these principles, these spiritual principles, restated the steps of action that we have in this big book. And yet, this has been, this is maybe the strongest moral force in the world today. <laughs> Certainly the strongest uh, program of action in the world today. And because it is a restatement of spiritual principles which have been around forever as, ste as steps of action, it's something that we can do. We don't just sit there in church or in a synagogue or someplace and listen to a lecture or a sermon and say, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. That's the way I ought to be. And then leave wondering how the heck do I get there? All we have to do is do the work of the steps. And we go from a place of rebellion and defiance and denial to a place of surrender and obedience. And so when we look at these steps and we say, well, not only are we learning what the problem is, but if we're working the steps, we are being granted the solution. And therefore, we ought not to be surprised that right here in the fourth step, we have the complete spiritual solution to the deadly symptom of resentments and anger and rage and revenge that have been killing us. Now then, the second part of the fourth step is our list of our own wrongs and the commencement of our list of those we have harmed. We'll find that beginning on page 67. We'll find that it is in the third paragraph on page 67 that we, that we do this. This is a separate, discrete, rapier-like list which we now get going on. It doesn't have anything to do with our resentment list, it is not a comparison in any sense 
The only thing that we use for our resentment list is the list of names. That's what it tells us, referring to our list again. That means referring to our list of resentments, we look to see whom we have resented. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done. How in the world can anybody miss that? Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done. We are not comparing their fault with ours. We resolutely looked at our own mistakes. This second list is only about us. And it is in this second list that we're going to now begin to search for resentment, I'm sorry, selfishness and dishonesty and fear. Let's recap. Let's recap here because it's important to understand. The fourth step, the fifth step, the tenth step, and the eleventh step deal with four defects of character. Four only. Four only. Resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. If you would like to check that out, you will find the tenth step on page 84 and the eleventh step inventory on page 86. And the, the defects which those Inventories look at are the same as the four step. Resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. Not one word in this big book about sin. We are not a religion. We don't deal with sin. And if something is sinful, we leave that up to the religious. And many of our folks are deeply involved in their particular church or religion and they may be viewing all of these things that we that we write about, discuss in our steps, as being sinful. That is certainly their prerogative. Nobody would argue with that. But that is not a We don't deal with sin. We don't make moral judgments. What do we do is we look to find out what did not work, and then we start doing what will work. We look to find out what's wrong with us today that we cannot fix ourselves that we need God's help to fix. If you wish to involve yourself with sin, that's certainly your prerogative and your right to do so. But as a sponsor, please stick with the big book because these things are laid out here for us as, as, a, as, as an inspired word. No doubt about that. These 12 steps were written in a half an hour. They just flowed off the pen of Bill when he was writing and, and millions of people later, millions of recoveries later, these steps have been working for mankind ever since. Why would we argue with that? So we're going to be looking now in this second part of the course that for selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. We're also looking at our self-seeking actions which give us a clue to our selfishness. We have five questions which we must answer. And these questions are to be answered in a narrative fashion. They are not yes or no answers. We're going to take our resentment list of just the names. <coughs> now let's give an example of how this would work. Let's say that the first name on our resentment list is Bob. <coughs> Looking at this third paragraph on page 67, the third line, this is the way it goes. I'm writing now a narrative description. With respect to my relationship with my father, where had I been selfish? That's question number one. Question number two. With respect to my relationship with my father, where had I been dishonest? Question number three. With respect to my relationship with my father, where have I been self-seeking? <laughs> and likewise, the fourth question, where was I frightened? We write about this. We write it down. Many of these things may well be grouped together. The same actions that we described for dishonesty and selfishness probably also describes our fears. <coughs> Though the situation has not been entirely all of our fault, we try to, to disregard the other person involved entirely. What don't we understand about that? We're not saying here in any sense, look, I did these things, sure, but 
but look what he did to me. No wonder I did these things. That's human solutions. Stuff. That's what they teach you in the treatment center. No wonder you did these things. You're not at fault. Look what he did to you. You got to feel good about this. You got to be comfortable. Balderdash. This is not a matter of comfortability. Not a matter of feel good. It's a matter of finding out what the heck's wrong with us so it can get fixed. These are things we can't do for ourselves. We have to know what they are. What did we learn back there right after the third step? A strenuous effort to find and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us from God. That's what we're doing here. And then finally, the next, the fifth question in this series, where were we to blame? In my relationship with my dad, where was I to blame? Not where was he to blame, where was I to blame? This requires of me that I get dead honest and that I look to see what was going on there. And we're not we're not going to offset any of this with any of Dad's blame. We're not going to balance the scale. It may be that I did very little that was wrong, and yet if I can learn from what I did, then I must do so because I'm searching here or dishonesty and selfishness and fear. I have to find out what, what, what these things were doing to me then and are still doing it to me today. Because that's my present reality. And in order for me to be set free, I've got to be set free from the things which block me from God. I mean, obviously, if I'm blocked from God, I don't recover. If I block from God, I am going to die because I have no choice. If I wish to recover, I have to have God between me and both. And anybody who says nay to that, anybody who wants to, uh, I don't know, <coughs> shave that down a little bit, wants to talk about some other way of doing it, fine, let them do that. But for you and me, if we're going to be effective sponsors, we have our handle right here. We want to stick with this. We want to follow the directions in this because we know that if we do that, we cannot be wrong. We don't have to make up anything. We don't have to philosophize. We don't have to invent anything. Bill once said, nobody invented an AA. It grew by the grace of God. He knew that. He knew that this was not his creation. He knew that he was inspired when he wrote this. He never wrote anything anywhere near this good again, as often as he wrote. And he wrote a lot of stuff that was ten times, that was terrible. But uh, this book has stood the test of time. Here's what I'd like to emphasize, guys. It might have been perfectly legitimate in 1939 to say, who are these people? Who are they to tell me that this is what I must do? Where is the proof? But this is 2002, five million recoveries later, six, eight, 10, 15 other 12-step groups out there for every human ill you can think of, and people recovering, the 12 steps work. And they work exactly the way they're set forth in this book. Now, one word has ever been changed, or ever will be. One of the things to keep in mind, you need to press this on your sponsees. What we have here, you tell them, look, this book was written by people who experienced what they're writing about. They recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. They're saying to us, we truly believe that if you'll do exactly as we have done, you too will recover. That's why we wrote this book. It says right in the front to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this volume. Okay, so that's first and second parts of the fourth step. Next week we will commence with the third part, our fear list, and we'll spend some considerable time on fear. That's our enemy. If there is a devil, his name is fear. One of